Good afternoon and welcome to From Script to Screen, uh, looking at video production in the context of learning materials. I'm Ian Forsyth and today we're going to be talking to Thomas Hogman, who I'll introduce just in a second. Um, but before I do that, one of the key things to tell you about is the fact that this isn't just about the two of us having a chat in a room and you watching. It's an opportunity for you to participate as well. Um, live webcasts are interactive and you'll see on my left hand side there is a chat box and at the bottom of the chat box you can just type your questions and hit enter and that will appear and they'll be fed through to me and we'll see what Thomas's responses are. So let's get some really good questions for Thomas over the next 45 minutes where we look at video production. Um, as I said earlier we've got Thomas Hogman uh, head of production here at DP Digital with us today Thank you very much, and yeah. we're going to be looking at some of the things, some of the tips and tricks of the trade um, either because you want to produce your own educational content or because you're maybe thinking about bringing somebody in to, to pr produce something professionally and you want to know really what are you buying and what are you looking for. So I think what we're going to cover today, Thomas, should cover both sides of that. Yeah. I think so, yeah, I think so. It's going to be it's going to be an interesting chat. And like Ian was saying, it'll be good to get some questions in from the audience too. Yeah, definitely. That's that's absolutely critical. So we really do want your questions. I've got a list here, but I'd be delighted if I only get halfway down that list and we can uh, challenge Thomas with some of your own questions. So video, I mean... <laughs> As a training company, DP were involved, obviously, in training originally, and we moved into video, so we, we saw something in that. But for you, what's the key strength of video in relation to sort of learning and training content? I think video is just uh, it's a, a really good way of communicating a message. There's something about using video and, and the visual style that it, that it has to, that allows you to condense down what would be quite a long piece in a, in a written word document into a short and concise um, tool. It's, it's also about how we learn as, as human beings. Uh, we're, we're much better, I, I feel anyway, at, at learning visually than we are from words on a page. That's why many technical um, uh, learning tools in the written word will have illustrations amongst them as well. But when it steps to video, it's, a, it's an if you can see it, then you can do it kind of approach. And that's what's um, so beneficial about using video. It, it opens that up for, for the user. And of course, more and more people are probably relying on places like YouTube for instructional content. Yeah, yeah and it is. It's, it's the second largest search engine in the world now, YouTube. And it, yeah, that's just angled purely at video. Um, and it is, and, and we're also much more comfortable with um, the visual communication. Using video as a communication mechanism is, is a language that we all understand. People have been watching television for generations now, you know, and it's a... Uh, and everyone's very comfortable with receiving information that way. We're no longer confused when someone will reappear in a new position. We understand the visual language of video. So it's good. I mean, YouTube's a good example. You look through there, there's some really great stuff. There's some stuff that makes you cringe. When people go about producing their own educational content, what are the kind of common mistakes? I think the most common mistake, and you know, I'm sure everyone out there will have seen this on YouTube themselves, is audio. It's the, it's the sound that accompanies the video. That's so often neglected. It's the, it's the, the, the little thing that you kind of leave till the end. Because if you're, if, especially if you're doing it yourself, you're concentrating on the picture because it's a, a visual medium. You're, you're concentrating on, right, I want to make sure they're in the right position, okay, of they've got enough light, it's not, they're not darked out and they're not bleached out in the background, everything looks good, right, okay, right, he knows what he's gonna say, he, he knows that where to look, right, we're all ready to go, okay, let's get going, and then record that without ever having checked or thought about how the audio is going to be recorded. And it can completely devalue something. You could have something that looks really nice, really beautifully um, beautifully filmed and beautifully put together, but with an audio track that's hissing and bouncing and you're getting these punches through where the mic pops and you're getting a, a or it tails off very quiet and you can barely hear what they're saying and all of these things just it will completely ruin any piece of video not just a training piece and we're going to look at equipment later on and talk about that but in general terms if you were giving people some tips around audio what would be the, the kind of basic the basic things to look for the most basic thing and it, and it sounds it sounds really silly but is to to listen just 
to use headphones preferably to have a listen. So if we were to be, um, if we were to shoot just a small interview here, like, like the two of us sitting here today, before we started, I would make sure I had the microphones on um, and I prefer to use a microphone, but if, if you don't have microphones, then um, just make sure that you get them sitting in the position where, where you're going to be doing your filming. And just, if you have someone else there as well, just have a little, listen to their conversation, just put your headphones in, just kind of listen in to their conversation. And that'll give you a really good indication of their normal talking voice. And it's nice then as well at the end to say, right, okay, I just want to do a little mic test. So can I just get you to just give us a few lines, tell us about your day, how did you get here today is a thing that we often use. Um, and you'll notice probably that they'll maybe use a completely different voice to the one that you've just been listening in on. And, uh, and that's because when someone steps in front of a camera, they often change how they talk. They feel they need to, well, I'm either going to enunciate myself much louder or I'm going to quieten down mouse-like and go very quiet. But over the course of an interview, they'll probably return back to that natural speaking that you heard before. So it's important to balance your audio between the two of them and make sure that you've got some, some kind of volume that gives you a nice balance between the two. And, and, but just try to use headphones, that would be the best thing. Try to use headphones and listen um, before you do any recording. And I assume that kind of process of talking to them will help to relax people as well. Exactly, yeah. And that's why we usually open with, so how did you get here today? It doesn't matter what you're talking about, if we're talking about in-depth medical things with the NHS or um, engineering with, uh, you know, Karen Gore, Solar or whoever. It, if you just lead with that, it maybe catches them a little bit off guard because they're expecting some kind of um, information challenging kind of questions and it just settles the nerves and allows them just to to get that first piece out of the way that first spoken word out of the way so then we can move on into something else and you can cut that out in the edit it, you, you, sometimes if you're on your own you maybe just film that as well and just just cut it out in the edit so that you can carry then straight on into the next questions right so it serves two purposes calms them down but it gives you gives you levels you've kind of focused there specifically on kind of in interviews or pieces to camera by from people um but i know you know you again you, you don't have to look very far to see all sorts of different techniques being applied what else can you use from a from an educational video perspective yeah, interviews often form the kind of heart of the video. It's the it's the it's the main body of the video, um, but that it doesn't have to be the way. And there are a lot of other techniques and other pieces that you can use to flesh that out. Um, some of them we call them cutaways as well. Is other material that we would film um, that we would then put in over the top of the interview. So we'd have our interview and then we'd cut away to a piece that would be more descriptive. Um, so we would show perhaps what the person was doing, the, the area that we're talking about, um, the, the piece of machinery that we're discussing, what, whatever it is that helps to illustrate the, the interview. Um, and that's what we call a cutaway. Um, but we can, a cutaway doesn't have to be live action, doesn't have to be a piece of video, it could be anything. We could have an illustration, a technical diagram, even text could be used as a cutaway to help re-illustrate that point. And it's trying to think creatively about Right, if I, as the user, what do I want to see now that will help to reinforce the learning point that's being delivered in the video, in the interview? Um, and, and that could be, could be any of those, but it's important to think about that from the user's perspective, what reinforces that, and that's the reason to use a cutaway. Okay, so trying to use something relevant then. Yeah. yeah. What about graphics and, and, and so you touched on that in terms of illustrations, but th there's more scope than that, surely? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. A, a, a static graphic uh, or an illustration um, is, is very useful, but it's, it's again, it kind of harks back to the, the written word, the print format of, of that. And it's very easy. We, we see it quite often in, in other productions as well, where they'll just copy that um, printed diagram into the video medium and it will sit there as the voice uh, runs over the top and helps to illustrate it. But let's not forget video is a, is a moving medium, it's a, it's a visual medium that it takes you on a journey that has a time, it's a time based medium. So you don't have to use a still image, you could animate this, bring it to life and, and, and let it evolve with the audio. So. Um, for instance, we were working on a project um, for Cairngorm Solar where they have um, solar thermal panels on a roof. Um, and we, we have an interview with, uh, with one of their engineers talking about the process of how the sun heats the water um, that allows you to generate free hot water in your home without having to pay electricity bills for a boiler. Um, and they had a, a, an image of a house showing the plumbing going through it. 
And yeah, that, that was fine, that fits in. But what we chose to do was to take that and take it to the next level and show the cold water, um, so the, the blue going through the panel, and then with the sun's rays coming down, warming that and taking it from blue to red to illustrate the flow of the, the hot water then coming back around the house. And we also took the front wall off the house so you could see the, the, the bath, the kitchen, the, the, the taps um, throughout and where the plumbing would go as well. Um, so that you could see how that was flowed around and collected and how it was all put together in a very neat and tidy package which is exactly what he was explaining, but that visual journey that we went on with it just really helped to reinforce that point. So in that instance, it was particularly useful to highlight something that you couldn't see. Um, yeah. and, you know, I can see that one in my head, but are there other examples, are there other, other areas where that kind of animation works well? Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's across the board when you start looking at, um, especially technically challenging um, training tools. So. We've done an awful lot of work as well within the NHS, um, and that's it's very specific um, work where it really can sometimes be life or death. So you have to get these details and these um, specific movements correct, and that's where these visualization uh, techniques come into their own. So um, 3D visualization, the one we were I was talking about there with Karen Gorman, is very much a 2D visualization where it's just an illustrated picture that we then animate on in, in on top of. But when you move further down the more technical processes, the 3D illustration comes into its own. And that's where you would have a, a virtual 3D model of, say, um, uh, an arm. And, uh, and underneath you would have all of your, um, your modeled muscles and the muscle structures and where the veins and everything goes. And you could have that and combine it with the live action. So we would film um, live action describing how the tendons in the wrist work and, and how that, uh, and if you were doing a surgical piece, how that would need to be uh, operated on. But then if you match frame that, so you would then go into the, the 3D environment um, and match up the frame so you have your, your arm in the same position, so your hand at the right of screen, your elbow at the left, and then cut to the 3D environment where you can then remove the skin, show the muscle, then show where the incision will be made and take you through the layers, removing them and maybe even highlighting these. So in, in, in real life, it would all be very kind of um, very red, very kind of a rich red colors all throughout the arm. But in the 3D environment, we can color code these different sections. So there's a, there's a clear division um, of where you want to go. And, that, and that's a really useful tool in, from a training point of view. Because although it isn't as the um, user will see, it, is, it, it illustrates the point, the learning point, much clearer than using what, what, you, what the camera and the eye would actually see. That sounds to me, though, as though that would be more technical in terms of production. That's not like just pointing a camera at someone. Is that something that someone can realistically do themselves? Um, I don't think it's something that you would want to tackle yourself. Um, it's very specialist skills. It's something that um, an operator would train in a specific piece of software for for a long time. But with the internet and the sheer um, the amount of material that are, is being produced nowadays, there's great stock of this kind of assets that have been generated that, that, that you could download and incorporate into your training. So you don't always have to have these things uh, commissioned specifically. There are There is great resources out there online. You just get onto Google and have a look for um, whatever kind of asset it is that you're looking for. And very often you'll be able to find something that, will, will, that can act as a starting point. Mm -hmm. um, and if it is, like I was saying with the NHS, the, often these things are are very specific, and it would be something that you would want to commission privately to to be produced by a, by a, a, an agency that would be able to do it to your kind of exacting standards and requirements. Um, but if it was, for instance, um, in if it was for a, a glove manufacturer that was producing a certain glove that had a certain shape, and you wanted to show the the, the nuances of the fit in the 3D environment, then you would be able to download a variety of different assets that would be pre-made to fit that kind of brief. So it depends on, on what the project is, but there is a lot of help out there online. And there are also some great, great companies across Scotland, that, um, and you don't have to travel far and wide to find people that can, can do these kind of things now, especially up here in the Highlands. And I mean, obviously, with something like that, without going into lots of legal detail, you do have to watch the copyright of, of materials like that, I assume. Yes, yeah. Uh, I think that's becoming more and more um, 
obvious through the news and there's a lot of reporting going on, especially over the last few years with, with the copyright issues, with com um, companies using images off Instagram and, and Twitter in the press and in the news um, where they're owned by uh, commercial photographers. And it's exactly the same when you're looking for assets online to incorporate into your projects. It, it, it can be very risky, especially if you go into Google image search pop in what you're looking for and just take one of those images off, drop it into your training and send it off into the world. It may well be that that image is copywritten. But if you're on a Mac or a PC, it's quite easy to kind of have a look at that and see where it stands. Most images, I'm, I'm just talking mainly about photography here, not um, digital assets like 3D assets or illustrations. Um, if you go into Google image search, find what you're looking for, drop it, copy it onto your desktop, if you uh, go into the properties on Windows or the Get Info on Mac, you can look at what's called the IPTC data. And at the bottom, there's a field that's, that will be filled out that tells you who owns the copyright for that image, if they've chosen to put that on. And, and that's really useful because it usually, um, I know for me anyway, I always put a URL um, and possibly even uh, there's a, a space for a, a contact telephone number as well in there. So you can go, right, well, I really want this image. I'll just send that person a quick email and go, hi, I'm producing this. Would it be possible for me to use this image in this piece? And if it's for training, very often it, 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 they won't be asking for a fee. And even if they are, it's, for a single image, I think it would be very achievable for someone to incorporate that in. And that means you're getting the image that you want as well. Right. So best to be safe there rather than sorry. With Absolutely. These yeah. Okay. Let's move back to you know somebody looking at producing a video training piece. Um, not be too specific, just in general terms. We've got a blank sheet of paper, we've got a specific training need that we've identified. Um, talk us through the planning process from a video perspective. What are the general things we need to think about when we're putting something together? I think it's very important to think right from the outset um, as how the user is going to uh, interact with this. Um, where, where are they going to watch it? Um, what are they going to want to do with it? Um, who, who are they, they going to watch it in a group? Are they going to watch it individually? Um, are, are they going to be led through it in stages? Or is this something that they, they're going to use to recap something? Is it uh, an addition to the training or is it their training? There's a whole world of possibilities and you need to think about these from the outset. So put yourself in your user's uh, position and think right. This is what we're targeting, this is who we're targeting. And that sets, the, the, for the whole rest of the journey, set yourself up right to begin with. And from there, you can start thinking about, right, okay, duration, how long does this want to be? Well, if it's, if it's to be used as a refresher for an individual on their own, then you know, three to five minutes can be a nice length for a part. Um, but if it's maybe gonna be used in a group environment, well then why don't we chapter this off so that we can have pauses, little discussions, and break it into, uh, break up maybe into a 45 minute training tool that has break points that signpost up areas for discussion. Um, but I think before I even start to work on any pieces of, of, of a film, I want to think about, right, how's the user gonna use this? What's the best approach to give it to them in the most user-friendly user way? Okay. Uh, and sort of putting together a storyboard and resources and stuff like that once you've decided what, wh how, how does that work in practical terms? Yeah, and that comes, that comes after that, definitely. So once you've kind of got um, your target market um, outlined and your, um, your kind of key message decided on, then take it into storyboarding and start laying it out. And I mean, it, you can use PowerPoint for this. It doesn't have to be through um, any of the specific storyboarding software. Um, you could just do this in PowerPoint and make up slides that have the key points on them um, that you want to cover per section. And maybe even get onto Google Images and g grab some images that, ha that you want to use as kind of visual references for when you're producing your training. So, is it going to be a sit-down interview with someone or do you want to see someone doing something or do we want to use a piece of illustration or, or an animation here in this part of it? But always try to limit yourself so that you're, you only have a few words per PowerPoint slide. Um, you can add additional comments in the box below, for, you know, your, your own show, slide notes. Um, yeah, sure, but try to limit the, the actual, each slide, storyboard slide to 
you know, maybe 25 words tops per slide and as an absolute maximum, um, because that means that can be an achievable little section that you, you then can, when you get to filming it. So we'll have just this little piece and then just that little piece and you can tick them off as you go and it, and it forms a really nice reference for it as well, for your right. filming. And it helps to keep you on track, obviously. Absolutely, yeah. 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 Um, we've had a, a, it's more of a comment than a question from David, but I can see exactly where he's coming from. We kind of touched on it. It's going back to the 3D animation and modelling. Um, and he's saying way likely to, likely to be way beyond the time and budget that he would have available. Now, we kind of touched on that, but I mean, I don't think we were saying that 3D and animation was, was, was absolutely vital to every video piece. But if you feel it's something that would add... What other ways can we deal with it if you don't have the budget to create an animation or 3D? Yeah, well, yeah, just to tackle that one there, it's, it's 3D and animation doesn't always mean expensive. We, 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 I know that that's often the, um, the kind of the perception of it because we go and see Hollywood blockbusters and they're just jam-packed full of uh, 3D and a whole world of um, virtual and visual effects going on around it. Um, but, you know, simple objects using asset libraries um, can be achieved really cost effectively as well. You don't, it doesn't have to be expensive. It depends on what it's being used for and what's needed. Um, so yeah, I, I wouldn't say it's always always expensive, but you can you can look at different ways of doing it as well. Like illustration is a great starting point. You, I was talking about 3D um, with uh, for visualization work, but you know 2D can be really useful in 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 animation work as well. And a 2D illustration can be produced relatively quickly as well, depending on the complexity, of course. But um, And it can also be changed and adapted um, relatively quickly, which is a, which can be where the cost comes into with 3D work. Mm. When you build a 3D asset or you produce something very um, complex in 3D, making changes to that at a later date can can take a lot more time. Okay. Um, but let's, let's just take David's point. Yeah, and say, right, okay, um, one of the two, you mentioned a couple of jobs earlier, you mentioned the solar thermal and you, you mentioned the, the NHS job. Um, let's say you were trying to complete one of those jobs and there really wasn't a budget for animation, but you felt that the your material would benefit from illustrating things in a, in a different way rather than just standard video. Are there no options open to you? No, there are lots of options. Yeah, there's still... Uh, um Perhaps one of the one of the ways to do it would be to, to use live action, but not just use an interview, but to break it down and 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 show what the the eye can't see with uh, use a camera to show extreme close ups of things as well. Um, take it down to the details of something. A, a camera is a, a, an amazing tool, um, and you can really see much beyond what the eye can see um, using a video camera. So. I'm not sure what, what David's industry is in, but um, for instance, the solar thermal project that I was talking about before, we could have taken that in and we could have filmed within the house, within the attic space, and used some of the low light capabilities of the camera equipment today to be able to see into these areas as well and, and show these elements too, and build it up um, using some uh, extreme close-up photography as well. Uh, and yeah, it, it maybe wouldn't have communicated the messages clearly, but uh, it would definitely have got across the story the same. Um, you could also think about using a, pre a presenter on a, on a green screen, perhaps, or something like that, where you have, like the weather, you have uh, material behind and a presenter in front that then leads the leads the, the viewer through something that is quite complicated too. So there's a variety of approaches. Um, okay. So, so creativity it trumps cash at the end of the day. It absolutely, it? and yeah. it always will. I think absolutely find a way to do it. Essentially, yeah. it, it, it's quite good you're talking about green screen there because I think the sample that you wanted us to show people yeah. um, specifically does have some green screen in there. And I, what we're going to do now is just cut to a little sample from a program called um, Business Foundations, which was designed as a business startup training tool. Uh, we thought we'd just play a couple of minutes of that just to let you see that and then have a look at some of the techniques and discuss those with Thomas and how they can be used to best effect. So let's have a look at business foundations. <laughs> Welcome to Business Foundations, the online course where you'll learn about setting up and running a successful business.
the stock is the, the biggest thing that's variable. Some months um, we'll have big sales, so we need to buy in the stock to replace that, and other months it's not so bad, so we've not had to replace so much. So that stock um, price will always vary, so we'll always have different amounts coming in and going out. When we first started up, probably the biggest thing we underestimated was marketing. Because we were that focused probably in opening up that um, we were suddenly open and then we realised there's this massive, massive job of marketing the centre. Actually, finding the name was one of the hardest decisions in the early setting up the business. In fact, we ended up writing out names and having discussions, some of them heated discussions about the right name, asking our friends to come up with names. Some of them were anagrams and acronyms and all these different things. And some of them were awful. I think the important thing is to have an absolute passion and belief in your product. Uh, I mean, I get excited about it when I do take the product out to, um, to, to, to the customer and ask them to taste it and then looking in their eyes and saying, it's good, isn't it? Now I'll show you how you can use that information to help you set your price. Let's plot a simple graph. In other words, it's your break-even point. If you sell more product or service at this price, you'll be in profit. If you sell less, you won't cover your costs and you'll make a loss. Normally you keep records of your mileage and your expenses and things like this because that which is used solely for business, well, that's an allowable expense. I mean, there is a process, obviously, the individual has to have certain skills, people skills, but there is actually a process involved in ensuring things happen in a logical flow. That's the benefit of the customer, and it's obviously the benefit of the person selling, the, selling that particular product. But it is, it is an art and a skill, uh, and it's something that has to be taught and developed. Yes. Okay, so you've seen there just a very short sample of a, a training piece that we deliver, uh, produced a, few, a couple of years ago now um, for Business Startup. Thomas, I mean, you know, you're pretty familiar with that particular piece. Talk us through some of the kind of techniques and approaches that are used there. Yeah, so as you can see from the sample, it was, um, it was driven by interviews that we'd filmed with, with real businesses um, out in the field. And... Uh, to help tell the story, we use the technique called the, the five shot. So that's a close up of the hands, close up of the face, over the shoulder, big wide shot, and then something random and, and interesting. And the reason we did that, we use that in film, and you'll see that if you, if you watch the news um, or you watch any television program, um, short stories are very often told with that visual language. And that's because, um, as humans, when we communicate with each other, others and when we learn, we, 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 we act in the same way. We'll look at uh, the person, so we'll look at the close with the face, so we'll look at the, the face. Who is it? Who's doing this? And then we'll look at the hands. Uh, what are they doing? What is it they're doing? Um, and then we'll look, right, a, a wide shot. So where are they? Where are they doing this? And then over the shoulder, so maybe have a little peek, see, okay, so, so what, what are they actually looking at? What is it that they're doing? And then we'll maybe think, oh, right, we're a little bit bored. Now we'll have a little look at something else, some, something interesting, have a look at it from a different angle. Um, and that's a really nice way of telling a story. And you'll have seen that we had close-ups, wide shots, faces, hands, we have a whole variety of those. And they can be put together in, in a lot of different ways as well to help carry the story. So I think it was moving from the, the go-karting to uh, the farm, we had a uh, close-up of some carts, and then we came back with some faces, and then we had a big wide of the go-karting. And then to make it clear visually that we had changed the location, we went to a big wide of the farm. And that's how we, we know that we're no longer in the go-karting. We're not currently not at, we're not at the go-karting anymore, we're somewhere else. And then we go close-up of a cow, I think it was, and then to our people again. Um, and that's a really nice way of telling a story. But you don't have to stick to that. It's sometimes interesting to break that as well. So you can go from, we could have gone from the, the go-karting to close-up of the cow, and that would be jarring. It would jar with how the user would usually watch something and how they were expecting it. And it would make them kind of perk up and take account, take action for it. Oh, what's this? This is different. Now we're not a go-karting, but we're at a cow. And it depends on how you want to tell the story. Um, but it's using, being creative and, and using that, that basic five shot is a really nice way of collecting footage 
Right. I'm seeing a great special effect here with a cow in a go kart. Oh, well, That's we challenge. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but again, just to reiterate, you know, picking up on what David said earlier about you know what's within people's budget. What that sounds like with a bit of practice, that's something that you could do for yourself. It absolutely is. It's a really nice way of collecting footage when you're out in the field that you know will give you a, a solid, consistent results when you get back and start editing. The five shot is the stable diet of every um, news reporter and correspondence team in the field. It's once you've got the five shot and you have a solid five shot, then you can start to be uh, more creative, but you know you have that in the can and you're, you're safe in the edit. So if someone has never done that before, if all they've ever done is, you know, they've gone on holiday, maybe shot a few things when they've been on holiday, um, they want to get a little bit more adventurous and a little bit more creative. How would you how would you recommend them starting off? Is it practicing? And if they were practicing, is it like a little routine they could go through? I mean, what would your suggestion be? Yeah, there? I, I mean, I'm, I remember when I started doing all this as well many years ago. Now, I used to have a piece of paper with the five shot written down on it, following whatever it was that I was doing. So if I was going out to shoot an interview with someone, I would have interview, then close up of the face, close up of the hands wide shot, over the shoulder, abstract angle. And I'd have that written down and I would tick it off once I got it. So I would shoot the interview with, with whoever it was going, so I'd get myself set up. And I always, for an interview, think we want our frame to be from the belly button to a fist above the head. That gives you a nice kind of normal looking framing um, for an interview. So I'd shoot my interview and then whatever it was that I was talking to them about, if possible, I would say, okay, can we just go and spend a little bit of time and can you just do it for me? Just do whatever it is, and I would just work my way through the list. So I would get myself, say they were playing golf, I would get myself into a position where I could get a close-up of the face. So I would try to get a nice angle and get the close-up of the face. So we're talking kind of from just at the neck uh, to just above the head, just top of the head. Um, and I would get that shot, um, and then I'd tick that off. So, right, I've got that one, right, close-up of the hands. So we're just, can you just show me that again? So onto the, the grasp of the club, getting position, just tension the hands, make sure I had that. And then I would, you know, carry on like that through the process and just tick them off so that I knew once I got to my abstract angle, maybe say, right, thanks very much for your time. That was really great. Um, it was really nice to meet you. See you later on. Let him walk away. And when he was walking away, I'd just be getting down into the bushes or something and shooting another angle of him leaving to his car. And I would be able to go, right, ticked off. That's me completed. And I would know that I had something safe then. And But it was, it was keeping it on a piece of paper and just ticking it off. And if I had three close-ups, three ticks, and I knew that I had that. Right, so you carry your bit of paper, you've got your list. Oh, you it's all in my head now, but <laughs> back then it was definitely on a piece of paper, yeah. But that would definitely be your tip to people, is make sure that they try to get that variety. Yeah, and I think that's the thing, when you start out doing this, if you're doing this for yourself, and maybe you're used to delivering training, or you're um, used to w working with groups, it can be very different when you suddenly have a camera. And it puts a certain pressure on you as well, especially if you're doing this for a team, maybe you work for an internal team and you've been delegated the task of filming this. Um, it's quite, it can be quite nerve wracking and it's very easy to, oh, I'm, ju I'm just gonna leave it on wide. and I'm just gonna go around and, and hoover as we call it, just hoover up everything. Mm. And you'll end up with maybe an hour's worth of a wide shot of a room or of a scene or of a person. And you don't have any variety then for when you take that to an edit to cut it up. So it's much better, I think, to have just some little notes so that you can just put force a structure upon yourself to make sure you've got it. And once you've got them, yeah, then go, right, well, I can relax now, I've definitely got this. Let's go and be creative. Let's shoot through a window. Let's, you know, attach a GoPro to someone's back and do that, you know, whatever it yeah. is. Yeah, right. So get the basics and then work from there. Yeah. Okay. Um, what about equipment? I mean... I know, you know, from our experience here, you can spend almost any amount of money you want on equipment. But if I was setting out tomorrow to, you know, just start from scratch and create a nice little educational video, um, what are the basics you think I would need to go off and invest in? Well, if I'm perfectly honest, Ian, you can do everything with the phone in your pocket nowadays. You don't, you don't have to. Starting off wise, it's a, not a bad idea to have a go with what you already have and see if this is something that you think, yeah, this is the, we, could, we could do this, this could work for us. Because in some cases, the time that it takes to make a video, uh, a, a video that's an educational tool can be very much underestimated and sometimes it's better off 
just to delegate it out to someone else and get, get in a team, put it out for commission and get in a team that does it, that can do it for you and then you just direct. But yeah, try start off with a phone, just your mobile phone. Most of them, have got, if you've got an iPhone, you can do the whole lot right through from storyboarding to outputting on your mobile. And, um, and just try out some of these angles, you know, work on the phone and just do your five shot on the phone. And if you want to do an interview, well, maybe use the webcam on a laptop. Just make sure you're not sitting in front of a window. You know, sit with the window behind the laptop so the light of the window um, helps to light your subject or else you'll get re these really high contrast um, um, scenes, which, which again is a real problem. And don't forget to think about the audio. Mm -hmm. Put some headphones in and listen to it. And if you're doing an interview with a, a laptop and you're just gonna do it as a, as a screen recording, well, record the interview and then put some headphones in before the person leaves and just have a little check back and a little listen to it. And if you think, oh, no, that's not very good or, or no, I'm not really sure of that thing, but moving the laptop further away, closer, you know, or preferably just get yourself a little audio recorder and have it down on the table as well. And that'll give you a much better quality audio to the piece. But just don't forget about the audio for whatever it is that's forming the backbone. If it's a voiceover or if it's an interview or whatever it is, just make sure you get a nice audio and then build your five shot around that. And, uh, and you're, I think you'll, you'll be surprised at what you can achieve. So I've gone out, I've had a little play about the phone. I've been quite happy with the results, but I think you know, I, can, I can take this a step further. In terms of the basics then, what kind of kit would you recommend are kind of almost a must have? Yeah, from there on, it's time to think about setting yourself up properly. And the thing that everyone does is goes, right, time to buy a camera. Mm, yeah, if you're gonna buy a camera, make sure you buy a tripod because a lot of people will go out and they will get a camera and then everything will be handheld and you'll have the same, it won't change the look much from the camera phone because you will still have the handheld look, everything will be a little bit shaky. You want to think about if you're going to buy a camera, buy a tripod. There are some great deals out there now and on HD little compact solid state cameras. So these are cameras that um, record full high definition. So you're looking for something that can film 1080p preferably, especially if it's going online. Think about P means, P stands for progressive. So um, for television, for the old CRT TVs, everything was interlaced. So you had lots of lines and uh, they uh, flicker between the two of them and that was an interlaced image. Nowadays with computer screens and, and most flat screen tellies as well, you're talking about a progressive image. And if you're doing film and training for online, then try to get a progressive camera because it just keeps it consistent across. So a 1080p little camera that's solid state is what you're after. So you're not having to think about tapes or the media you're recording onto. It goes on, onto SD cards, preferably, which is the same card that you have in your little holiday snapper camera as well. Um, and make sure you get a tripod. Right. And what about audio? I mean, is that, do we need to take a step up? Because you, you mentioned audio earlier on. Yeah. Again, the, these cameras aren't, aren't bad for audio. They're much better. They'll give you um, a nice automatic control. And a lot of them are set up for filming an interview at the same kind of distance we are from here. So between kind of six and 10 feet from your subject will give you a nice audio. But if you're going to be filming at maybe conferences and events, then you need to think about getting a lapel microphone. So that's these little mics, and you can see them on over the webcast, but they're just little tie clip mics that you can clip on and it'll give you a much clearer and much better sound. But then you need to think about your camera. Does your camera take external audio feeds in or does it only have built in audio? And you're slowly working up the steps here. And once you get up to the stage where you're thinking about, right, lapel microphones, um, cameras that can take XLRs in and all these things, then it's time to, you, you should really be thinking about either taking some advice on this um, that, so that you can get the right kit that's most appropriate for your needs. Um, and, and that will change depending on who you are. There isn't a kind of one size fits all solution when you get to that level. The bit that we've kind of missed out so far is I've got all of that stuff. Um, what about putting it all together? I mean, editing it. Yeah. Again, it's, an, it's another thing that's very easily forgotten. And that's where you see, uh, you can see occasionally that people will really fall down because they will try to, they won't have any way of editing it. And they'll try to shoot it all in camera and then put it out from there. And you have, right, okay, just stop the camera there, right, next one. And then you try to try to get it. You, 
you need to try to do some have some form of editor. And if you're Mac based, then you've got iMovie, which is it's surprisingly good. You can you can do a lot with it, especially from a um, an interview point of view. It allows you to cut bits off and and add other clips in, um, and also control your audio again. Do some post production on your audio too. Or if you're on a, a PC on a Windows PC, then you have um, Windows Movie Maker as well, which isn't to be honest as good as the the iMovie, but you can get, um, you could easily get some um, software like Premiere Elements, um, Adobe Premiere Elements is a really nice editor that's for both Mac and PC, and it's a really, it's a stripped down version of the professional um, Premiere Pro, and it's about 85 pounds, and, uh, and it gives you a really solid set of features that you can use. But there's a whole world of them out there, there's um, Movie Plus as well for the PC, there's, there's a whole variety of different software, um, to get, but yeah, once you once you've kind of moved on from the, the the trying things out on the phone thing, then it may be time to think about okay, I need to invest some money here, put some budget aside, and invest in some editing, uh, tripod, camera, and that kind of package together. And when it comes to kind of distribution, do these packages they can output stuff in format for YouTube and for DVDs and yeah, especially the um, these kind of entry level editing suites. They usually have presets made up. That allow you to put stuff out straight to YouTube, so it'll put it out in a format that's 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 really friendly to for uh, for YouTube. I think iMovie even allows you to directly send it to YouTube, which is a nice little feature as well, um, because that can be a real challenge, especially um, when you look at, at some of the compression software that will take your nice HD, really nicely finished, nice color depth and all this video, and then crunch it down into these kind of jerky, muggy kind of uh, uh, c compressed video files that, that, that you're just throwing away all of the, all of the work, the hard work you've put into. Um, so yeah, so you can output to YouTube from there. It's also a good idea to think about putting something out as a, as a master. So if your camera shoots 1080p or your iPhone shoots 720p, put it out at 720p and have it so that you can go on a USB stick and on a lot of flat screen tellers you can plug that USB stick into the TV and play it back in your telly as well in a training environment or even in a lobby uh, uh, in, in your office or wherever. And, and that can, that's, a, that's a really nice way of distributing it as well. And let's not forget DVDs. If you're posting things out, a DVD is a really nice universal format, but you need to think about how you're going to author that DVD. You can't just drag your, um, your uh, video, exported video file onto the disc because it won't play back in all DVD players. You need to put out a VTS folder and a VOB folder and, and things like that, which, which you need to put through a, a, um, a DVD authoring software as well. Uh, so you've got iDVD on, on Mac um, that comes um, on some of the OS, OS X's as well, um, and there's alternatives as well on the Windows platform. But again, we're working our way up the pyramid from um, having a go at this and producing something mm. that we want to put on YouTube and then working our way up to something that's much more complex and requires more work. I'm really conscious of time. In fact, we've almost run out, and I know there was another piece we were going to let people see just at, at yeah. the end. Um, <clears throat> but we talked at the beginning when we were, we were going through the, the introductions. We were saying that this isn't just about you know people producing things for themselves. It might be that some people are sitting here watching this from a perspective of I'm thinking about bringing professionals in. Now, over the years, you've worked with a number of different clients. You've seen. Yeah. quite a lot of, of things going on. What would your top tips be to a customer in terms of if you're looking to commission some professional video production? If you're looking to, uh, my, my top tip for someone looking to co commission it would be is to make a really short brief. Put something together that's half a page with bullet points that outlines exactly what it is you're looking for to be produced and make sure you're putting yourself in the user's shoes when you're writing that. So not only, right, we want to have uh, an interview with so-and-so, an interview with so-and-so, um, and then an animation that shows this, that's then all wrapped up with an interview with so-and-so. Think about where is this gonna be distributed? Who's the target for it as well? And, in, and introduce that stuff into the brief as well. So we're looking for delivery um, to uh, 18 to 35 year olds who have come out of education and are now moving into their first levels of, 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 um, on, of training within the workplace. Um, and so that, so that as a professional, you can look at that and go, right, okay, well, it'll be good to have that um, for them so they can take that away and watch that at home. So we wanna maybe put this as a distribution method, have this on a USB stick 
so that, so so as a, so the professional can get their kind of teeth into not just what we're going to film, but how it's going to be used, so that they can add their experience to that and build a package that's really effective. Because after all, that's why you're bringing someone in to do this, is to add value to this piece. So don't try to um, micromanage it, you know, and, and, and put too much information in it. Maybe have that yourself, you know, in a, in a yeah. small dossier, but have a short brief that opens it up to them so that they can get the main facts straight and then flesh it out as well, and then meet and discuss that with them, and make it a, and have a discussion with them to, so that you're both on the same page and you can pick the key points out of both sides and put that together into a really nice package. Okay, but know what the end game is in terms of yeah, what's going always to have in mind what the end game is. Well, believe it or not, we have actually run out of time. Um, so um, one of the things that I really wanted to make sure everybody was aware of today was designed largely as a taster for the eLearning Alliance um, because we are running a workshop on Tuesday the 28th of May at 10 30, from 10.30 until 4 o'clock at West Lothian College in Livingston. And Thomas and the guy behind the camera who you're not seeing today, Alan, um, will be running that workshop. So it's your opportunity to, I think, develop some of these ideas, get people out with their camera phones. We'll take some kit with us as well. Um, it's a great opportunity for you to take some of the things we've touched on today and maybe take them a step further and see whether video production might be something that can add real value to what you're doing at the moment from a learning perspective. Um, so just remember that date for your diary. It's Tuesday the 28th of May, half past 10 until 4 o'clock at Wesleyan College in Livingston. And indeed, Leslie in our office will be sending you an email um, with all of the details and you book in the usual way through the eLearning Alliance. Um, that's all we've got time for just now, but we do have, because it's such a glamorous life, <laughs> the kind of media life and producing film. So if you're not convinced yet, what we thought we would do is show you a wee bit of behind the scenes footage and um, watch really closely because it was the film that I think it is. The very last frame will show you um, Thomas falling into a ditch. It's worth <laughs> watching just for that. Thanks very much for your time and hopefully see you on the 28th of May.
my god. <laughs> I told you there was a ditch there. <laughs>